Very good evening to all of you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this uh, High Court Judges Colloquium on the theme, the rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty. I have with me a very distinguished set of judges whom I will introduce shortly. On behalf of OP Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Law School and our knowledge partner, Live Law, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. I know that many of you are on live in Facebook and in YouTube. I invite you to send in your questions as we begin this part of the segment where we will be asking questions to our dis distinguished judges. As India has quickly moved to be the world's fourth hit country in the world by COVID-19, this is perhaps the most adverse crisis we have exposed in our times. A health crisis is very quickly spiraling down to a socio-economic breakdown of nations across the globe. This pandemic has exposed us to a broad range of issues globally and domestically. Xenophobia, domestic violence, reverse migration, cyber frauds are only a few of the many problems plaguing our community today. The massive disruption in trade and commerce is manifesting itself into a host of disputes around contract disruptions, employment and tenancy, and also some of the more serious challenges relating to rule of law and access to justice. It's indeed a very demanding time for the Indian judiciary as the strain on our courts continues to increase considerably and it's palpable. We are indeed in the midst of an extraordinary and unanticipated phase of the evolution of law and practice. COVID-19 may come and indeed go, but we will always live in the anticipation of next such pandemic or crisis. Therefore, there has been no time more challenging than now for the justice systems to respond to the growing demands of justice. The Indian judiciary faces a three-tier challenge today. The three crore plus pending cases, the rapid rise of corona bone legal issues, and the transformation of the delivery of justice through e-adjudication and technology-driven dispute resolution mechanisms. We need to swiftly adapt to the changing judicial landscape and also embrace technology to provide timely justice. This also presents us with an opportunity to reimagine and redefine ourselves and to think outside the box to put in place a system to absorb the influx of cases and innovate changes to the legal and judicial architecture of India to be more resilient in such a crisis in the future. Therefore, this colloquium is, very, is an important platform to discuss the way forward for the rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty. I have with me a very distinguished set of judges who have on a working day after a long day's court proceedings have taken time to be part of this colloquium. I'm grateful to them for that. Let me introduce Honorable Miss Justice Anubha Rava Chaudhary, a distinguished judge at the High Court of Jharkhand. She completed a law degree from the University of Delhi and came down to her hometown, Ranchi, to start practicing at the Jharkhand High Court in 1995. She has been a counsel of the Government of India and also worked as a panel lawyer for different banks and financial institutions and also companies. She is also a board member of the Jharkhand Legal Services Authority. Welcome. Justice Chaudhary for this colloquium. We have with us Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol, a distinguished judge and Chief Justice of the High Court of Judicature at Patna. He is a former Chief Justice of the Tripura High Court. He is also a former judge and acting Chief Justice of the Himachal Pradesh High Court. Justice Karol obtained law degree from the Himachal Pradesh University and in 1983, he was enrolled as an advocate, practiced in various courts and had ex and excelled in his legal practice. Thank you very much, Justice Karol, for joining us. We have this Honorable Mr. Justice Ashwini Kumar Mishra, who is a judge of the High Court of Judicature in Allahabad. He obtained his BA Honours in Economics from Kirodimal College, Delhi University, and LLB from DU as well. He practiced mainly on civil, constitutional, and service side. He was engaged as arguing counsel for many statutory bodies. He was also engaged as senior counsel with the state government in important matters. Thank you, Justice Mishra, for accepting our invitation. We have with us Honorable Mr. Justice Sundresh, the judge at the Madras High Court. He works as and also worked as government advocate between 1991 to 1996. His precise presentation of cases on facts and law acquired a good reputation. He was a counsel for the Tamil Nadu Small Scale Industries Development Corporation and had extensive practice in civil, appellate, and criminal jurisdiction. He was appointed as a member of the monitoring committee to oversee the establishment of reverse osmosis system to the dying units of Tirupur and Erod district by the Honorable High Court. We are very fortunate that Justice Sundaresh is with us. Unfortunately, Justice uh, uh, Sureshwar Thakur is not able to join us for this evening's colloquium. Let me move to the substantive part of today's discussions. My first question is to Justice Karol. Justice Karol, the very foundation of a nation's response 
to the current pandemic crisis is the law. What are your views on the effectiveness of the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897 and the Disaster Management Act 2005? Would it help and possibly would it make a difference to have a more customized set of laws and regulations such as what some other governments in the world did, the UK's Coronavirus Act or the Singapore's Infectious Diseases Regulations, some of which are unique experiences to respond to this crisis. Justice Karun. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Justice Karun? Yeah, good evening, uh, all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I must uh, thank uh, Professor Rajkumar and my co-panelists for being uh, today with us. I must also thank uh, all of those who are uh, with us uh, through this uh, virtual mode. Straight away coming to the answer uh, uh, question which you have posed. See, the bedrock of any democracy, more so the constitutional democracy, is the rule of law. And uh, what is law? It must define, it must be definite, and it must define a relationship between the state and the citizen. The state has a duty towards its citizen. It is an armory for better compliance, transparency, and accountability. Now, in this time of pandemic, let us see what is the two, which are the two domestic laws which we have. One is the colonial law of the 19th century law, and one is the most recent 2005. Now, if you were to contrast these two laws, as I have always been saying, law is not what the chancellor's foot is. In 19th century, precisely that is why the law was enacted. Because the historical perspective and the object and purpose of that law was that the, 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 the then legislators did not want anyone in the times of those pandemic or epidemic to come to, to travel and sail and land into the shores of uh, England. Now, when this law was uh, enacted in the year 2005, the backdrop was one cyclone that was tsunami. Now, if you were to compare both these two statutes, you would find that uh, the 19th century statute is just a four section statute. Effectively, it is a single section statute. It is a comprehensive or it is omnibus. It is vague, unspecific is for us to now decide adjudicate because the matter is pending for different courts. But if you come to the 2005 statute, the backdrop in which that statute came was to cater to and need of uh, the disaster, which was predictable, cyclone, floods, Famines, for example, these were the various uh, yes. uh, disasters. Now, 2016, if you recollect, Honorable the Supreme Court has said that the mechanism provided under the 2005 Act has not been put in place. In Sir Odia Abhiyan, Abhiyan yes. judgment. This is what the Supreme Court said. Yes. Now we different times look at the look at the impact of uh, this COVID 2019. It has a cross-border impact and implications. Now, therefore, in my considered view, let first let us see what is the effect this pandemic has. The first thing is it affects the health of each one of us. So health-related issues. And when I say health-related issues, that is pertaining to the life, living being, as also with regard to the bodies or which are affected, uh, disposal of bodies which are there uh, as a result of uh, this pandemic. Now, these are wider issues which need to be, which have to be addressed. Should we leave it to the executive? Should we leave it to the executive to understand what the law is? Should we leave it to the uh, courts to interpret what the law is and uh, read it down or read it uh, or legislate for that matter? I have examined uh, both these domestic statutes, that is the Singapore statute, as mm. also the uh, UK statute. Mm. Uh, UK statute, if you read 
yeah, I'm sure you have read it, specifically deals with each one of the issues which we have seen arise in India yeah. in the last few months. Migration, for example, unemployment, rights of paramedical uh, professionals, right. those, the corona, the... the I, healthcare, I, I, healthcare workers, the healthcare workers. The healthcare workers, I call them guardian angels. Yes. And uh, the disposal of uh, dead bodies, the tenancy issues, the migrants, and above all, the people they calling upon the asking the civil society to come forward and volunteer to fight this uh, situation, which is enormous, enormously affecting our lives. So, and and above all, the mental health issues, as you rightly pointed out, xenophobia at one point of time. You didn't mention all this. Now, in my view. Having uh, examined all the laws, these four statutes, let us see what the central government has also done. They have come out with an ordinance. It is they have found that there are some loopholes which required to be plugged. And that is why immediately they came in with a legislation, with an ordinance right, to legislate and say that uh, those corona warriors need to be protected. In my view, we do need, time is there now, to have an umbrella legislation to deal with all the issues which, have, which we have found in these three last three months. And mind you, this adversity is not temporary. It is here to stay for, as we understand, for some time. So perhaps the need of the hour is to have an umbrella legislation. Thank, thank you very much, Justice Karol, for really setting the stage for the rest of our discussion today. Uh, let me move to Justice uh, Chaudhary. Uh, Ma'am, you are, of course, uh, part of an, a very important court, but also a very important state where a range of issues are uh, being confronted at the same time. So it will be very useful for our audience. What role you think can judiciary play in striking a balance between the issues of equitable access to public health care and the protection of rights of the medical health care professionals, especially the people who are at the front end uh, when it comes to COVID-19. Now, I ask this question also because of the fact that most of the time, the judiciary is uh, you know, asked to, in many ways, adjudicate uh, and strike balance with regard to competing interests. So to what extent do you think the judiciary is in a position to respond to these issues in an effective manner? Uh, as uh, Justice Carole has just now said that there is a lot of uh, 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 loopholes uh, regarding the legislation and a lot of gap is required to be filled. So at this stage, judiciary has a great role to play. And uh, uh, in fact, the judiciary has taken the call and uh, if we start with Dawkin, he said, taking rights seriously. And Professor Upen Bakshi said, taking suffering seriously. Now, all the wings, be it legislature, judiciary, or executive, all of them have taken the sufferings very seriously. Our target is the persons who are suffering. It may, it, they may get the redressal through orders of court. They may get re redressal through the acts of the executive or acts of the legislature. It is a mutual trust in this age of uncertainty, which we are, we are experiencing in India. This is the constitutional goal. This, this rule of law can prevail only when all the wings, they work together. So uh, my view is that uh, uh, judiciary has played its role. Honorable Supreme Court has taken uh, a number of PILs, number of orders have been passed, and the judges have played the role as a catalyst. If you see the catalytic effect of this, for example, uh, uh, the problems of migrant laborers, the, the problem of uh, health workers, their salary issue, all these things are being taken up. And today, as I see in the news, that there is also uh, uh, an, an order to ensure that there is a, a national plan, national disaster plan is in place. 
so uh, the areas of delegated legislation which were uh, missing uh, to be uh, taken care of by the legislature and executive the honorable supreme court is uh, taking care such that those steps are taken it's not that supreme court is legislating you see that uh, they within their domain each one of the of uh, us are doing the bit i want to share one very good example which has really saved ranchi to some extent uh, we had a containment zone in in ranchi where the first case came and then it spiked then uh, uh, we found that our uh, honorable chief justice found that there is a place from where the people are coming out of the containment zone he immediately took steps to ensure that that uh, particular uh, area is plugged in and then uh, steps were taken had that step been not taken i'm sure ranchi would have would be the entire ranchi would have turned into into red zone so it's a very good step taken by our high court and uh, i'm extremely thankful to the honorable chief justice for having taken such steps every high court has taken and done their bit so uh, judiciary is filling up all the gaps and uh, we have lived uh, up to the i think that uh, up to the expectation of the people and the constitution and uh, we are in the phase of transition thank you very much justice chaudhry that was very helpful and indeed very useful because institutional leadership is so critical at this juncture let me move to justice ashwini kumar mishra uh, justice mishra our community is likely to be plagued by disruptions born during covid 19 such as commercial disputes loss of employment cyber fraud many of these things are already beginning to see how do you imagine the landscape of high court cases and litigation to evolve in a post corona world force majeure and issues surrounding force majeure is dominating many aspects of contract negotiation how will this impact the judges the lawyers the litigants and various other stakeholders of the indian judiciary and as a corollary to that given the nature of the corona bond legal cases how critical it is to prioritize court operations as essential services during the pandemic this is mr uh, can you unmute yourself um, vidyut unmute everybody uh Justice Mishra, can you unmute yourself? Uh, sir, there is a prompt. There must be a prompt on his screen to unmute. He he has. Yes, to yes. Me. Now we can hear. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, the prioritization is definitely required because uh, we are, as the problem of COVID is unfolding over a period of time. Uh, in fact, we are in a very uncertain state, not exactly knowing how this particular problem is evolving over a period of time. So, immediately as the problem has come, the immediate uh, concerns relating to the rights of individuals, how the migrant workers or those who are uh, denied access to medical help, these are aspects which have to be taken up on priority, and that is what apparently the courts are immediately doing. so far as the other aspects as you have said the commercial aspects the, uh, the these are all aspects which would arise in due course and uh, i'm uh, sure that parties would have to initially interact because it's not immediately the, it, there has to be some deliberation amongst the parties uh, some good sense prevailing aspects of equities coming into play it is after because everybody is conscious of the difficulties that are being faced so competing interests are there the and uh, the courts would uh, obviously like to give a first opportunity to the parties to examine the issues and then those matters will ultimately land up before the courts the courts would then take up the issues as per the law and the provisions uh, would be uh, newly given effect to so far as the uh, uh, problem as is presently being faced by us on account of covid is concerned there's one aspect which i would like to highlight that uh, the immediate task 
and this also relates to the first question that you have posed to Honorable Chief Justice uh, Roll. See, we, the, the legislation can be can come into existence. The desirability of legislation is not an issue. We would definitely want the rights to be uh, and the position in law to be clarified so that the parties know where they stand and how the courts are to then implement it. But in a scenario where the situation itself has not fully evolved and we are still in a transitional uh, phase, the subject of legislation itself has not yet crystallized. And therefore, the problem would be as to whether this is the right time to come up with the legislation as and when the requirements would come into existence, possibly as my Lord the Chief Justice just referred to coming into existence of the, uh, the issuance of the ordinance by the central government. So from time to time and depending upon the uh, subject being asserted, the laws will have to come. So in the, in the requirement is definitely there, but it will, you will have to wait for some time before the subject itself gets crystallized that a more uh, uh, informed and an appropriate law would come into existence. Otherwise, it might be some sort of a knee-jerk reaction and the law without proper scrutiny and research coming into existence would not be a very healthy uh, scenario in my understanding. Please, thank you very much. Just, you, you're, you're saying something, Justice Mishra? No. Okay. Thank you very much, Justice Mishra. Um, in fact, one of the things which you said is very important for our discussion as well, which is that to what extent uh, courts' capacity to respond to this crisis is also dependent upon what kind of legislative and administrative tools that are in place. Uh, that takes me to Justice Sundaresh. Uh, Justice Sundaresh, as we look at uh, the situation emerging in uh, the state of Tamil Nadu, uh, there are numerous challenges like every other, many other states as well. So my question to you is that, how prepared is the judicial system, not only at the level of high court, but lower down, particularly when it comes to district courts and other courts, when it comes to responding to this entire challenge? Because the fact of the matter is, Corona has not stopped the very process of other aspects of civil and criminal justice uh, system uh, delivery mechanism. Clearly, that has also impacted. So to what extent your court uh, is responding to that? Yes. A, a very good evening to uh, all, all the co-panelists. It is always uh, a pleasure to share the dice with all the distinguished panelists. Uh, this is a very important question which uh, you asked. One thing is clear, we can't close the courts. As you rightly said, we should stay relevant. In so far as the, the subordinate courts are concerned, we can broadly divide them into criminal courts and civil courts. Now, coming to the criminal courts, now we, we use e-filing for deciding uh, the applications filed for bails and anticipated bail, which is, of course, anticipated bail before the principal district courts. And we are also adopting the same procedure in the high, high court. Now, dealing with the, the, uh, the matters touching upon the presence of the, witness, of the, of the, uh, the, the witnesses, especially recording of the statements, now we are we are making sure that it can be there. It can be done done by the video conference, which we are actually doing it because it might require while well, recording the statement under Section 164 of the Criminal Procedures Code and in Fox's uh, cases involving uh, the offence under the Fox Act. We are also extensively using the technology in so far as remand proceedings are concerned. This is, this is with, with respect to the, the criminal cases. In, in, in criminal cases, in civil cases, sorry, in civil cases, again, we are using the video conference facility. Urgent interim orders, we are, we are hearing them, though we have some issues with respect to the, the connectivity. We have taken it on the judicial side also. The High Court has issued orders extending the, the interim orders, which are already there, so that the, the lawyers need not, uh, and litigants need not bother about it very much. 
So this is how we are, we are, we are proceeding with the matter. Now, after assessing the situation, we have moved one step further. We have substantially opened up all the district courts, right, right from the, the court of principal district judge to the taluk court. As, as far as uh, till now, we have got no issues on that score. We have had continuous meetings with the principal district judges and chief judicial magistrates. So we have opened out, except in those districts which come under the red zones, which is inclusive of unfortunately the Chennai also. So courts are actually functioning, though in a staggered way. The response from the lawyers, I would say is, is rather encouraging. And when these go by, when they feel more confident, we are we are inclined to increase the number of cases so that normal court hearings will take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Sundaresh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for all of you watching, we are live on Facebook and YouTube. I invite you to share your questions uh, as we move into the second segment uh, shortly. Uh, let me move to Justice Karol. Uh, Justice Karol, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Bihar, and Jharkhand are some of the states which witnessed a massive return of migrant laborers. What role you think can high courts in various states play to not only facilitate the safe integration of these individuals into local life, but also ensure broader uh, social justice and even social security and indeed safety and well being of these laborers? In some ways, to what extent courts have been sensitive and providing institutional leadership to address this challenge? Uh, Justice Carol, you can unmute yourself. Justice Carol, you can unmute yourself. There is a you need to unmute. You can leave it like that. And Justice uh, uh, Rodri, also you can unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I am my connectivity issues there. I I muted myself. Unmuted myself. Can you just yes, repeat? We can hear you. The connectivity issue. Oh, sorry. I'll repeat the question. Um, uh, okay. Just scroll the question to you. Uh, can that you just uh, repeat the question? I will repeat the question. Because there is a connectivity you... issue. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, the question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Jharkhand are some of the states which which witnessed a massive return of migrant laborers. So what role you think can the high courts play in these states in particular or other states to facilitate the safe reintegration of the migrant laborers into the local life and ensure justice, including uh, social justice, but also social security, safety and well-being for them? Justice Karol, you heard my question. Uh, Justice Karol, did you hear my question? Uh, yes. Uh, maybe I can take that question to. No, no, no it's all right. I, I can. I can. You check. heard it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, unfortunately, uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, for uh, these people, and particularly Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Urissa also, has uh, created a situation of where there's higher burden which people have to share, both at the local level as also at uh, the national. And the first burden is uh, the health crisis as a result of this pandemic. And uh, the second is the issue of reverse migration. I'm using the word reverse migration because these are the people who unfortunately for economic reasons went away from their home state to earn their livelihood. And because of uh, the pandemic, they have to come back. Now it has thrown very many challenges. And uh, the first challenge is uh, the discrimination and violation of human rights. 
at both the places, places where they were uh, working and places where now they have come back. They carry perceptibly a stigma as uh, carriers of uh, this disease and uh, the super spreaders. So there were uh, this ostracization and uh, reintegration uh, into the village life is very, very, became a very big challenge. But coupled with this, uh, double discrimination, I would say, is the socioeconomic factors, particularly with regard to the gender, the caste, the age, particularly with regard to the women, the infants, the old and the infirm people. The transgenders, for example. So these were the various uh, challenges which, uh, sure, other states would have also uh, come across and which be in Bihar we failed. So what did judiciary do? We have uh, our constitutional power. People came to us by way of uh, public interest litigations. We exercised our power under 226, for example, just to illustrate in the issue of uh, Corona warriors, in the issue of transgenders uh, who had uh, sustenance issues. So we had to issue directions. But most importantly, we engaged the hard legal services authority in uh, dealing with this issue. Because this was, some, some, this was uh, one issue which had to be dealt with compassionately. You could not you know, deal with this issue with a police force or with force. So we engaged the primary, uh, what do you call these uh, workers and uh, the uh, warriors. And we sensitized people, went, reached up to the people in the villages, in the quarantine camp, sensitized them, provided health uh, related information, legal awareness, their rights were made away to them. And uh, wherever necessary, relief camps are also engaged. We, the legal service, Bihar Legal Services Authority has done a commendable job, uh, a classic case of uh, text study perhaps, where people were made aware and uh, eventually successfully uh, they were able to, you know, uh, uh, let these people go back to their uh, homes and uh, intermingle with their uh, family and uh, their way of life. So that is why how Bihar has done in this. Thank you very much, Justice Karol. Uh, we are live on Facebook and YouTube, and I look forward to hearing from you about the questions. Uh, can I move to Justice Chaudhary? This is Chaudhary, the, there have been a number of states in which uh, relaxation of labor laws have been considered as an avenue for boosting economic recovery. Some states, including UP and MP, have even implemented changes uh, to alleviate the current economic distress caused by COVID-19. How effective do you think this could be? But more importantly, what can we learn from the COVID-19 experience to reform and possibly even strengthen our labor laws so that the vulnerability of the, uh, of the marginalized uh, is protected even during difficult times. That's right. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, some of the states had taken uh, measures for uh, changes in labor law, like UP suspended some of the labor legislation from its effectiveness and increased the working hours. And uh, 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 you see, what is happening is that uh, mere suspension of labor laws, etc., is not sufficient. That will not address the issue. Some of the people who are uh, uh, trying to uh, support this move is to say, they want to say that uh, industries from China and other countries will come down to India if these uh, labor legislations are taken care of. But if it is suspended for three years, that will not serve the purpose. So uh, we know that the labor uh, laws are um, uh, under uh, consideration, uh, their simplification, their rational rationalization and the consolidation, everything is on the board and uh, that may need more discussion. And uh, it also requires more of inclusive uh, uh, consultation with the labor union, the workers. And uh, one thing I want to share with you all is that uh, the 
entire episode of migration of labor has uh, pointed out one thing that the employers had the employers taken little care only providing food and basic needs i'm sure that this situation would not have come and uh, uh, having not done so it has demonstrated that uh, the labor force in india they need care that protection that compassion is required these employers they did not realize that if they would take care of them in the time of crisis they will be more committed working you see huge organizations which are uh, one century old and all they have taken so much of care even in jharkhand uh, old organizations they have taken so much of care of their labor their employees they have not there is no wage they have released the bonus which is normally released in the month of uh, october during puja vacation to those employees so that confidence between labor and employer has to be there in absence of that no legislation no reforms can really take place. thank you very much so uh, what i feel is that these one sided measures are not sufficient. please please go ahead these uh, one sided measures suspending the uh, the labor uh, uh, application of labor laws or increasing the it cannot be it just cannot be it needs uh, more of compassion and consideration is required yeah thank you very much justice choudhury for that you are absolutely right that uh, this uh, this moment required greater degree of compassion and understanding and even a more progressive approach towards dealing with these issues not only because of the fact that there are you know uh potentially benefits but most importantly it's also the right thing to do because the crisis does not uh, differentiate uh people in this manner people are all vulnerable and it becomes almost responsible for uh people who have that type of power uh to uh you know contribute to that so thank you very much for that let me move to justice mishra and we want to shift gears in relation to some of the other implications of this crisis now from the use of technology driven applications to track the covid-19 cases arogya setu is an example to the potential use of facial expression recognition software for lie detection during e hearings technology can be an enabler however this also brings back to the surface of existing concerns about privacy as a more general issue but also data privacy in particular what course of you know legislative and other types of actions are needed to ensure privacy as a very critical uh, both a public policy goal and a constitutionally protected right uh, is there such a thing as too much of technology that can potentially undermine some of the more fundamental aspects of civil liberties this is mishra i will just like to uh, uh, read two paragraphs Please. from the celebrated uh, and often quoted judgment uh, of the honorable supreme court in gupta swami case sure. and uh, what the uh, honorable justice uh, of the chandrachu has stated and really just two paragraphs is possibly uh, it is uh, virtually very it becomes very relevant for the present context It says this court has i'm reading paragraph 324 this upon an exhaustive enumeration or a catalog in entitlements or interests comprised in the right to privacy the constitution must evolve with the felt necessities of time to meet the challenges thrown up in democratic order governed by rule of law the meaning of the constitution cannot be frozen on the perspectives present when it was adopted technological change has given rise to concerns which were not seven de- which were not present seven decades ago and the rapid growth of technology may render obsolete many notions of the present hence the interpretation of the constitution must be resilient and flexible to allow future generations to adopt its content bearing in mind its basic or essential features possibly what his lordship observed in this paragraph becomes very very relevant in the present context i, I would like to correlate it with the experience that we are facing the virtual courts that we are uh, now Uh, promoting and most of the courts are depending on dependent upon one of the aspects which i would like to uh, place 
is that the fresh matters which are being filed before the courts. Now, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, we came out with a provision which required all persons who swear the affidavit to appear before the court and their photographs is then taken and affixed on the petition itself along with the affidavit. Now, this was done because many a times it happened that certain persons, uh, their affidavits were filed and later on they retracted or said that no, we never came to the court. Now, in the present context, when the petitions are being filed by email, the difficulty arises as to how this particular affidavit part is taken care of. This is, I'm illustrating as one of the as aspects to, uh, to highlight that the technology, though has taken care of much of the concerns, but it has to evolve drastically to meet the current challenges as uh, uh, we are facing. The right, of, right to privacy is one aspect the protection of data, the rights of privacy, all these are tremendously important aspects and the concerns have to be taken note of first by the legislation, by the executive and upon their failure to do so, the courts will have to respond to these uh, very uh, severe challenges because ultimately the rule of law will require that these concerns are adequately uh, uh, taken note of and while balancing the right of the individual, the liberties and the protection of rights, the aspects of uh, privacy are uh, taken care of so that uh, these kind of mischiefs, the bank frauds, so many things which are happening on account of these uh, greater use of technologies, that these, this is uh, definitely a very challenging area for the judiciary, for our judiciary and uh, I'm sure that uh, the courts could respond to it in a, as is required. Thank you very much, Justice Mishra, for laying down that because I think uh, during these difficult times, uh, one does expect institutions such as independent courts to be able to rise up to the challenge even when there is enough, let's say, provocation, but also possibly demands to defer to both legislature and executive. And even during these uh, you know, circumstances and situations, we need to protect the rule of law. Uh, let me move to Justice Sundresh. Justice Sundresh, one of the things that this COVID-19 has caused is also to create disparities and even exacerbate some of the disparities even within the legal profession. As we know, the Bar Council of India has taken measures from exploring emergency funds for independent practicing advocates in need of financial assistance to the relaxation of, uh, and courts have done, relaxation of dress code for courts as well. What role you think various institutions, including courts, but also uh, bar associations and other such institutions can play to enable that lawyers, particularly the ones who are more vulnerable, are not, let's say, significantly affected and adversely impacted during this crisis? Because we know there are a lot of uh, you know, dependence on day-to-day -day court cases in lower courts is the only source of livelihood for a large number of lawyers, not necessarily the ones who are practicing in high courts, but also particularly the ones who are practicing lower courts. What can be done to make them more empowered during these difficult times? Uh, yes, uh, see the problems uh, are not only with the lower court, but high courts also. Okay. okay. When, when you talk about lawyers, you talk about lawyers who are practicing in different fields. Sure lawyers, emerging lawyers, budding lawyers, and uh, lawyers who have put in some work in particular fields, and senior lawyers. Now, this problem, Bar Council of India has taken it up. For example, I am I have been invited to some of, uh, some of the uh, relief uh, measures taken by the Bar Council of India, where a uh, substantial amount of money has been collected. They identified uh, the young lawyers who are in need of financial help. They made distribution to, to, to them. I mean, these are all the one-time uh, measures. It is not that we are going to alleviate uh, their difficulties all the time. But Bar Council of India can play a further more proactive uh, role in this situation. For example, in leading in, uh, in, uh, in teaching the young lawyers or even uh, the seasoned lawyers who are not very computer savvy, how to go about it. Because the physical co uh, functioning of the court 
is going to be a long, uh, long distance as we look from, from, from this present scenario which we are facing with. Correct. So these set of uh, this, these measures, they can re really educate the lawyers. After all, uh, lawyers in particular judiciary uh, as a community, we are not susceptible to change. <laughs> in fact, uh, in that way, I would say that we are very conservative. We always resist change. Having said that, change when it comes, we can't stop. Either you, whether you change yourself, accept the technology and go with the wind or become irrelevant. So the Bar Council of India has got a bigger role to play. It can, it can identify the lawyers, teach them how to go about it in a situation like this. Secondly, it can also address the issue, the problem faced by the litigants. It can, it can prepare a set, a set of young lawyers who could volunteer themselves, deal with, with the litigants, address their problem which are facing now, and create a scheme providing financial assistance to such lawyers also. I mean, these are all certain, certain, certain I'm only by expressing my views. Sure. That certain views so that we can, Bar Council can come out with, with a better scheme. Correct. Because they, they, they have to take uh, their, their leadership role in this crisis. And they have to be proactive. And furthermore, Bar Council of India can, will have to interact with the judiciary and find out uh, uh, the, the, the further progress to be made in the given situation. There, are, there appears to be a disconnect between the Bartolos of India and, and the, uh, the head, heads of the judiciary on, on many, many counts. We can have more such interaction, discuss with, with the common problem, and move ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Justice Sudresh, uh, for that. Uh, in fact, one of the good things about such a crisis is also it, it has the potential to bring together different institutions which are ostensibly performing very different tasks but the crisis, uh, you know, since the stakeholders in the justice delivery system uh, as lawyers and judges and others who are dependent upon these institutions, it is only, uh, it's only appropriate that these institutions come together. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are live on Facebook and YouTube. I invite uh, the viewers to send in their questions. I intend to get back to the questions in the next uh, several minutes. Uh, let me move to Justice Carroll. This is Carol. Uh, several weeks ago, the Supreme Court of India, in, in a suo motor order, uh, issued guidelines for the courts to function through video conferencing. This, of course, marks a tectonic shift in Indian litigation at some levels, although some of the earlier steps have been taken. Now, what are your views on e-adjudication and technology-led dispute resolution? Now, can technology uh, be useful to help us clear some of the backlogs of the Indian courts what challenges has the legal fraternity experience so far? I know you have been, uh, your court has been functioning. I know several high courts have been doing it. I know the Supreme Court of India is also doing it. Is India equipped with the required infrastructure to sustain the e-court rooms so much so that we can actually use this as an opportunity to democratize and make the justice system more inclusive, taking technology into the lower courts as well? Uh, uh, taking a uh, clue from what uh, Justice Mishra, my brother Justice Mishra has said. See, uh, let us be, uh, one thing is very clear that uh, the justice delivery system in India has not come to a halt with the lockdown. That's a very good part of this, uh, pan, and this is pan-India. Each one of us, be it from the municipal court right up to the municipal court, have ensured that uh, access to justice is there vis a vis the fundamental rights of individual litigants. I must say, uh, my brother from uh, Madras said that, uh, and I must say that uh, both the bar and the bench have actually risen to the occasion and uh, taken this as a great challenge to overcome the challenges which have been imposed or which we are facing because of this pandemic. Technology 
is after all nothing but an enabler or a tool for strengthening the justice delivery system. Uh, courts have been uh, the e-committee in the Supreme Court and uh, the government of India has uh, institutionalized uh, technology and the justice delivery through technology. But the real test of uh, putting it to use has come now in this time of pandemic. Now, I must here also mention of uh, what Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Justice uh, Bobde said. The technology must be simple, it must be inclusive, and it must not exclude the common man. After all, we are here only for that person, last man who's there in the remotest corner of this great nation. I must also mention here what Honorable Justice Chandrachur has said, that uh, our response at this point in time would define, Honorable Justice Chandrachur is the chairman of the E-Committee of the Supreme Court, he said that our response at this time would set the trend as to how we would grow in future. You rightly said that the, at the high court level, perhaps technology, has been institutionalized. But when it came to the grassroots level, when I'm using the expression grassroots level, at the ground level, the munsip, the last man in the remotest corner of, the, of this great nation, has uh, technology reached there in terms of both hardware and software? Not only that, is the litigant, most importantly, for whom we are here, even aware of this uh, technology? And has he benefited of this or not? Now, this adversity, in my considered view, has uh, enabled each one of the high courts or each one of the judicial officers to sensitize, make people aware, and adapt readily to all this. Now, I'll just give you one illustration. I'm, I'm sure each one of the panelists or each one of uh, in Pan-India, have different experiences. Uh, uh, the, I would call it the Patna experience. Mm -hmm. I must tell you uh, that uh, the bar and the bench, and especially my brother colleagues on the bench and the bar, they have really, really, really come, risen to the occasion and uh, helped use this technology in uh, dispensing justice. Just to give you one illustration. In the month of December, the High Court, you know, to prioritize listing of cases, had come out with a scheme or a policy that if only you were to file uh, your pen drive, uh, hard copy, along with that file, uh, soft copy, uh, we would uh, list your case on priority. Now, between December and now, uh, December and March 16, only three such petitions are. Now, that is one example, extreme, I would say. Now, look at the other extreme, how we have been able to adapt and evolve. That from 16th of March onwards till today, we have had uh, 20,000, almost 20,000 cases listed in the High Court itself, from e-mentioning to e-filing to e-hearing. And that is today how we are functioning. And this is at the High Court level. Coming to the grassroots level, I'm using the expression grassroots level. Sure. At the, at the district and the subdivision levels. Today, 50% of the courts today are functioning. We have, we have evolved a hybrid model. 50% are manual and 50% are with the use of technology. Yes, there are limitations. Tech, uh, the, the bandwidth is a big, big problem. Hardware at, at certain places is a problem. But then we have been able to immediately uh, find solutions to this, to all these, these problems and these challenges. Now, uh, the, I've already said what the bar and the bench have worked together for uh, outreaching the, to the people. The biggest challenge according to me now is to what uh, the Supreme Court has, uh, uh, three judges, uh, of Honorable the Supreme Court have done is that uh, that bench headed by Justice Chandrachur has become totally paperless. I think that is the challenge now. 
for each one of us. And we have to meet up to that expectations insofar as the infrastructure is concerned, in, in so far hardware or software, we have been able to, you know, with the passage of time now, we will institutionalize it. We have sensitized. Another thing, yes, another thing, another challenge is this, that uh, the technology, the language of the technology has to be that of a common man. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, because our conversation, the tools are used only in English language. I think Hindi or regional language, that's another big challenge which we have got. So these are Thank you. Things. Thank you very much, Justice Karol. That was very inspiring. And I think uh, uh, it's quite compelling that how necessity has become mother of invention. And even when people are resistant to change, a situation of this kind has enabled people to change and come up with uh, new ideas and new perspectives which they were resistant before. Uh, I want to take this question to uh, Mrs. Uh, Chaudhary as well. Uh, I would like you to briefly reflect on the technology part because for many of us who are in Delhi and other places, we don't know much about what's happening in the Jharkhand High Court. I'm sure many of our viewers would like to know more about how uh, your High Court is responding. But it will be also useful for us to hear about the role of uh, Suomoto interventions by courts. I mean, clearly the, the Supreme Court's intervention on the question of e-adjudication uh, was a sole motor matter, but we've had many other courts, Patna High Court taking uh, sole motor cognizance on loss of life of an individual in a train carrying migrants. Madras High Court took sole motor cognizance of violence and medical personals, uh, medical personal funeral. And there are many, many stories emerging out of different high courts. So in this case, this sole motor power uh, do you think this has assumed greater significance during this time? Uh, Justice Chaudhary. Yeah. Uh, first, I must address the uh, first part of your, uh, your two part. So far as uh, Jharkhand is concerned, it is to inform you all that Jharkhand is not as backward as people perceive it to be. You see, our Courts are, all the courts are functioning full-fledged in the sense that we are working through e-courts only. Sure. But every bench is available. Secondly, the judges are uh, deciding their own board depending upon the, uh, the manner in which they are able to take up the cases. We are taking up old matters as well. And the what we what i am doing myself is that when the old matters are coming to my board uh, i have criminal revision matters so criminal revision matters the scope is quite limited we all know so the when the matters are on board we uh, connect the advocates and uh, most of them express you see most of them they express their ability to argue the case and i'll tell you the reason very shortly Secondly, we also give them the opportunity to file written submissions. We ask them to file the written submissions and the uh, judgments they are relying upon in advance. Uh, I go, we all, all the judges, we go through the briefs, we go through the ju judgments file, they exchange the written submissions. And then at the time of argument, they argue their matters. If there is any lag, we, uh, we put questions. They are also at liberty to file additional submissions responding to our query, such that nothing is left out. And uh, uh, the bar in Jharkhand High Court is absolutely young. High Court, Jharkhand High Court is a very young High Court. Most of the elevated judges are also recently elevated. Within a very uh, short time, they are here. So we do not have any problem dealing with technology, dealing with cases. We, I don't handle files at all. Everything we get scanned copies. We have uh, day before yesterday in division bench, Honorable Justice Apresh Kumar Singh was sitting in Devghar. I was at Ranchi. The councils were at other places. And this is how we are functioning. So far as district courts are concerned, yeah, I must inform you all that recently in a, uh, within a, uh, there was a drive for uh, uh, this mediation. In that mediation drive, the district, district courts have settled 239 cases. And this settlement has been even through video conferencing, mostly through video conferencing, 
and those people who could not connect their their cases have been adjourned so and you see we are providing access to all the advocates if a person is sitting at in a district and if he wants to argue the case he can come to the legal services authority we are providing infrastructure over there he can argue his case from there we have a technical support for them we have technical support in jharkhand high court for them so i am really delighted to inform you that jharkhand is doing quite well and so far as my case is concerned all mentioning stands alone no mentioning is to be rejected as far as my individual court is concerned so we are doing our bit now so far as the uh, uh, other part of the question is concerned regarding the intervention of the court and filling of the gap is concerned uh, my view is that too much of legislation in this kind of a situation not be advised because every pandemic or every disaster will have its own peculiarities and legislation is in place lot of delegated powers have been conferred there is a gap so that gap has to be taken care we after we cannot pitch in the courts cannot pitch in after the harm is already done if a person already dies what is the big idea of a litigation arising out of it so we have to come up and in fact supreme court has come up supreme court has demonstrated how robust is our indian judicial system we have addressed every kind of situation and it has all it has been welcomed by all corners and respected by all corners followed by all corners i shall just give one example to this yes. recently in delhi the problem uh, of covid uh, the honorable supreme court had taken up the matter that the uh, situation is grim so this catalyzed the entire situation the union government the state government they came to the same platform and they then they all have taken the things more seriously so this basically is facilitating the way for dispensation of justice this is our sole motto and our great constitutional goal this is what i need to say thank you very much uh, ma'am that was very inspiring to learn about the leadership that your court has provided in responding to these issues and more importantly how uh, courts have uh, even come to deal with the complex uh, issues of governance in which even to bring together uh, state and central government to take things seriously uh, let me move to justice mishra this is mishra one of the big uh, uh, you know outcomes of a crisis of this kind is that the vulnerable people of different types Uh, require special attention who might end up getting ignored one example is the overpopulated indian prisons with an occupancy level of over 100% uh, and there is a huge sense of vulnerability and if you also then start looking at who are the people who are in the prison a large you know proportion of them are under trials as well with temporary bails under consideration to decongest jails there is a huge challenge with regard to outcome of hot courts can do uh, during these times how do you think courts such as yours but also generally judiciary uh, can play a very important role in 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 relation to the vulnerability of the prison populace in relation to covid-19 itself this is a very important aspect uh, which you have just taken up uh, professor rajkumar i must tell you that uh, ours is one of the biggest state and it is the biggest state in terms of population right the court at uh, allahabad and also the bench at lucknow has been continuously working and the concerns of these uh, marginalized section and those who are particularly in jail has been taken up at the very initial stages itself our honorable chief justice issued certain directions and after that following the orders which have been passed by the honorable supreme court at every jail every district this exercise has been taken up particularly those who have Uh, the uh, the uh, jail term is less than seven years. They have been taken up, and those persons, the uh, uh, courts have ensured that uh, at least uh, those persons are released at the earliest. The problem is at a different level, particularly in a state of Uttar Pradesh, where the number of prisoners and the facilities which are there 
Uh, in fact, I can just take for an example. Some years back, I had an occasion to deal with one of the districts, Basti. Now, what we were informed were was that uh, the number of persons, uh, the total number of persons lodged in the jail were at least more than two, two and a half times the capacity, and therefore there is a tremendous challenge to deal with such a situation. Now, where there are persons who are uh, uh, wanted or uh, in serious crimes, the concern of the society and uh, has also to be taken note of. But wherever possible, wherever possible, under trial prisoners, all I can. Uh, one of the concerns which has been taken up in the Rabat High Court is that almost all pending bail applications, whether in districts or in the High Court, have been taken up on trial. even during the time of lockdown when it was not possible to uh, conduct the court proceedings or where the technology had not been put in place and i can tell you that uh, even if the technology is in place the magnitude of work is such that suppose if the uh, uh, we start conducting the e court proceedings and we are uh, holding e courts the number of uh, the, the time which is consumed for disposal of one matter because you have to connect to lawyers they have to be heard the all this procedural part also takes some time so the a, a particular court in the entire day may be able to take up 15 20 cases but in a state like ours and in the uh, criminal courts the every day filing would be say almost 100 120 so if even if the courts are taking up the matters by the uh, the e courts functioning all those matters cannot be taken so what is being done is that as uh, honorable the chief justice crow uh, just observed that we have a hybrid kind of a system so what is happening in our court is large number of courts are sitting at allahabad and also at lucknow obviously because of uh, the hot zones in certain areas uh, coming in the close vicinity of the lucknow bench the functioning from tomorrow onwards and otherwise also we are closing uh, after friday that has been disrupted but in allahabad large number of courts are sitting all criminal matters are being given priority matters are being taken up the courts even if large number of matters the courts on their own even when the hearing was not taking place i am uh, i do not have exactly the figures but some of the courts on an average 80 to 100 matters the bail applications in minor offenses were being granted even after just by going through what has been stated in the petitions So the court has been very, very considerate. We are conscious of the people's expectation, the challenges that are being faced, and to ensure that the liberties of individuals are protected, particularly because of the COVID constraints and the uh, medical issues that they do not uh, infect other persons. We are conscious of it, and what all can be done is being done to the utmost capacity. Thank you very much, Justice Mishra, and that's been very instructive. Being part of a very large state, and so these are very important issues that your court is dealing with. Let me move to Justice Sundaresh. I must um, tell uh, all our distinguished judges here that I have already received over 150 questions as we move to the second phase of uh, the Q and A session. Obviously, I won't be able to take all of them. Uh, Justice Sundaresh, uh, my question to you is that uh, you know, building upon what Justice Karol and uh, Justice Chaudhary, as well as Justice Mishra, mentioned under these circumstances of e court rooms and you know e adjudication and virtual uh, you know enabler of justice, you know to what extent will the reach of justice be unfortunately restricted by India's limited internet penetration? Last I saw a data point which was which made me feel very sad that less than ten percentage of Indian households. have internet facility relatively uninterrupted electricity and possibly a device where they can you know use that instrument for the purposes of many of these activities will this run the risk of creating a new form of social digital divide by exacerbating the lack of access to justice for people who don't have the required technology infrastructure e skills or resources justice sundresh yes sir i can't agree with you more this is a sad truth having said that we have to embrace the technology as you preface it when you start your 
speech this does create a barrier between a, a class of lawyers against against others much more in the present scenario but we have to synchronize technology with the ongoing uh, the functioning of the code we do have our own difficulties as uh, honorable chief is uh, said reluctance on the part of the lawyers is quite apparent especially in the civil cases now even even among the civil cases if you could take, take if it is a commercial dispute we all know the thrust is towards a commercial uh, litigation you could find lawyers finding themselves very comfortable in moving the cases and addressing the issues now take for instance yes yes your suit for partition between the members of the farm family or suit for specific performance where ever ever you have one of the property is 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 likely to lose his property in such cases the lawyers dealing with these cases may not be quite equipped this is in so far as the lawyers are concerned the division would come also among the litigants we can safely divide the litigants into two parts those who are rich and those who are otherwise when you deal with the litigants who can't afford this obviously they they cannot have access to this technology but this is a problem which we have to address to get over this in future as we discussed technology is something we cannot afford to dispense with because it is one for the future we have to move but one good thing about this technology is that it has got the potential to move from litigant uh, from lawyer centric even just centric to litigant centric now we have to make sure that the technology reaches to the every nook and corner of our our country as the chief justice has said to the last court once that happens the technology would be very well adopted especially by the anglos i would find that the difficulty would arise mostly from the lawyers who are not well versed with the technology namely who are seasoned practitioners an ang lawyer today though not exposed that much to technology as compared to compared to his counterpart you know yeah, who is who is practicing in the city would i'm quite sure would take this uh, takes the technology willingly and adopt himself much better therefore it is on us to make sure that the bridge is kept sufficiently so that we can have a fine heady mixture of the fiscal code hearing with the help help of the technology through through uh, the, the use of uh, uh, the, the video conference and other facilities and then thank you very much thank you very much uh, just this is sundresh uh to all the distinguished judges we are now moving into the second segment of uh, our uh, colloquium as i said we have 150 plus questions so let me start with justice karol this is karol there is a very interesting question from professor sandhya drew who is a very distinguished professor from the city university of london and she has written this uh, watching this program from london her question is that um, how does the suspension of labor laws by some states impact the enforcement of the rule of law are there any new developments that courts are responding to particularly not only limiting to the covid situation but even beyond uh i am not sure uh, whether uh, someone has really gone through these ordinances which was issued because there is no suspension Suspension strictly with regard to okay. all the laws of uh, the labor laws. Sure. See, they have uh, created uh, both. Uh, there are Madhya Pradesh and uh, Uttar Pradesh. They have come out with uh, an ordinance mm -hmm. where uh, they have suspended some of the laws, labor laws, but uh, in short, 
that insofar as the wages are concerned, in far, insofar as the dignity is concerned, insofar as the fundamental rights are concerned, they are protected, one. Two, there are uh, seven other states which have come out with the legislation. Mm -hmm. And all they have done is that uh, they have ensured that uh, the constitutional uh, mandate is uh, there in place and uh, the time, uh, the duration for which uh, the time uh, for which they are to work is extended. Now, well, let me tell you one thing. Uh, obviously, insofar as rule of law is concerned, there cannot be suspension of, uh, uh, there cannot be two thoughts about it. Yeah. Labor laws have to be there. We have to abide by it. But what I want to also add to that is this, that uh, any industrial workforce and not the capital is the backbone of any, in any advancing nation. So we cannot, uh, we cannot, there is no way that we can ignore the rights of, uh, especially these uh, persons. Thank you very much, Justice Karol. Uh, Justice uh, Chowdhury, there is a question from Karthik Mishra. Uh, this is about mental health issues. I mean, you know, uh, even the Supreme Court had recently, uh, you know, responded, uh, you know, how do you think that issues relating to mental health is particularly vulnerable within the legal community? And the reason this question has become important now is that uh, there are various uh, responses that are emerging from judiciary as well. And to what extent you and your court possibly uh, would be uh, in a cease of uh, issues surrounding mental health, not just within the legal profession, but also issues that are confronted from a legal standpoint to address this issue. Uh, so far as mental health issue is concerned, it is uh, uh, common with all sectors. There is so much of uncertainty. There is so much of uh, depression amongst the people. But at the same time, if we see our roots of our uh, culture, and then uh, if we go for slight spirituality, you see that helps a lot. And I feel that uh, uh, in the personal level, in the sure. personal level, that helps a lot. But these uh, uh, the issues of mental health are to be addressed. A lot of counseling to the advocates is required to be done. And that is why I feel that as many advocates would be arguing their matters in the court, we have to help them such that they are they remain engaged suppose there is an advocate who has a case he wants to do it may not be a very urgent matter but he wants to do it then under such circumstances if he is provided with the technology even if he does not have if he is provided with the uh, infrastructure to argue his case that should be permitted to be done this is how the courts can come to the rescue of the advocates the very fact that uh, the once the advocate is not uh, doing his work, his uh, source of income is dried down. He is in great hardship. So this psychological aspect is also required to be taken care of. So uh, this is how I feel Thank about the matter. And that is why I feel that court should be functional as much as they can, taking care of the entire public health. Thank you very much, uh, Justice uh, Chaudhary. Uh, Justice Bishra, there's a very interesting question from Pradeep Bhattacharya. This is about, and several of them have asked this question about the dispute resolution situation, where to what extent the current situation can create a new form of alternative dispute resolution uh, in a regime. To, is arbitration and mediation and conciliation is it going to be the new way of litigation wherein parties are able to you know, negotiate and uh, deal with the crisis that will have more equitable principles brought into that discussion? And ultimately, uh, in several questions, uh, several people have asked this question, uh, Amit, Sujay Singh, uh, Shivam, Varun, many others. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, I uh, entirely agree with uh, the proposition because uh, these are very special uh, situations where specific equities uh, would have to be adjusted between the parties. And uh, as I said earlier also in, uh, initially, that 
In fact, this is the best uh, situation when the mediation has to step in first. Because between the parties, both the parties, suppose if somebody has entered into a contract, the terms have been settled. Now, the force major, as you said in the initial part, the force major clause, clause is there almost in most of the uh, uh, contracts. Now, the situation has, a peculiar situation has come into existence which has adversely affected the implementation of the contract as it was originally conceived. So everybody is aware of the fact that the uh, pandemic has brought in a new situation altogether. And therefore the parties strictly cannot stick to their positions as for the contract. And this is the ideal scenario in which I uh, 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 do feel that uh, the mediation should be uh, given a chance and that's what this mandate of section 89 also is. That's what most of the judgments also uh, says of the Honorable Supreme Court in the outcomes and other matters. So this is the situation like the rent control matters. Number of uh, issues are cropping up. The, the tenancy laws, the other aspects, these are all the contractual uh, breaches situations arise. Now the capacity of both the sides to strictly act as per the contract may be seriously constrained or crippled on account of the pandemic. So both parties must be given a chance to sit across and that's what uh, in a spirit of because it's not exactly a question of right or wrong or deciding what is right or what is wrong as per the contract. The courts ultimately will have to go as per the laws. But before that, in a situation of this kind, I do feel that individual disputes must be resolved firstly by resorting to mediation in a spirit of coordination where the parties uh, consider and uh, appreciate the uh, situations which are arising and adopt a reasonable stand so that uh, they are able to resolve the issue which would, which would also avoid the quotes of much of uh, the burden which otherwise would come up. Thank you very much, Justice Mishra. Uh, Justice Sundaraj, there are a number of questions from, uh, you know, Yashomati, Raunak, and uh, Bala, and Jilmil. They are all asking a question, and maybe it's applicable for all of you. May I'll start with you. To what extent do you think that this current emphasis on, you know, online technology, virtual courts, e-based resolution of disputes can be taken beyond COVID-19? meaning are courts as institutions prepared to see this as a new normal and continue with some of these things in the best interest of the larger effort to have a more swift and efficient uh, you know, dispensation of justice? I think it's a very excellent question. I foresee a situation which will, uh, which will create a decision-making process sans the courts as they exist today in future. Similarly, a lawyer could access an argues case from the southernmost tip of the country before the Supreme Court. Now, this is going to be a, be, be a reality in the future. What is the consequence? I leave it, to, leave it to, to the August body and all others to see. It might create a complete makeover in the institution. You may not need a court hall. What will, what will happen to the practitioners in different places? We may not know. Then what, what is, how do you call the justice? Is this a byproduct of the institution or is a commodity as a product as such? Somebody can access it. Court can, yes, hear the other side and deliver instance in judgment. I would foresee, I actually foresee this, this. This will result in changing the entire procedural law and substantive law. You can divide law into two. One is a procedural adjective law. Another is a substantive law. These two fields will undergo a sea change in future, which we are happening now. If you take the commercial litigations and all other substantial enactment, like Transfer of Property Act, 
Now, if you see the Explicit Performance Act, now the idea is to give a certainty or terminate to the decision. Now, today we have, we are about five judges sitting. Now, tomorrow they don't want, if the same problem is given to all the five judges, including Mellon, the Chief Justice, our thinking process will be different. Somebody try to be innovative, somebody try to be conservative, somebody would like to think, go by the text, somebody would like to try to cross the barrier. Now, if you see, see the projection of the, the enactments, particularly the commercial litigation, everybody wants the same, same answer to the same problem. So I would foresee huge changes in future. Maybe this pandemic situation is a, is a triggering point, but we should be prepared to go on a different road, meaning that by uh, the professors like you, the lawyers community, judges, we need to, we need to prepare to take, take, take note of this, this change, which is forthcoming. Thank you very much, Justice Sundaresh. We are obviously coming close to the end of it. I'll have a couple of questions. Uh, Justice Karol, there's a question from Abhilasha Ramakrishnan. Abhilasha is asking, how can Indian courts deal with the huge influx of cases post-COVID? Would an online dispute resolution scheme like the one that Hong Kong has undertaken, which mandates negotiation and mediation as a first step in some matters work in the Indian setting? Most certainly. There's no doubt about it. We have to experiment that. The boilerplate cases, uh, like cases, they need to be uh, identified. And disputes uh, immediately uh, uh, taken uh, and cases dealt with. ADR mechanism is something which needs to be immediately you know, uh, addressed. And uh, we have to, you see, the core principle of adjudication is not going to change. Technology is mere tools. The AI, which Honorable the Supreme Court or E-Committee has, uh, has been emphasizing on, is going to help identify and immediately tackle with this, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the issue which has been highlighted. And uh, the virtual courts, for example, in the last uh, four weeks you have seen, uh, the E-Committee has uh, inaugurated uh, two uh, two places, Delhi and Kerala. So therefore, uh, 12, uh, if, I'm, if I correctly remember, 12 lakh cases were, uh, you know, dealt with uh, in this, through this mechanism. And the, we need to adopt that. So there's no doubt about it. Yes, we have to put it, uh, implement it. Thank you very much, Justice Karun. Uh, Justice, uh, Justice Chaudhary, there's a question from one of our students, Tejas Kotari. He's asking, uh, how has the criminal side been impacted due to COVID-19 uh, since search warrants, uh, investigation procedures are difficult to conduct while maintaining social distancing? What kind of measures and interventions have been possible uh, during this time? So far as the criminal justice system is concerned, that has really been affected and uh, uh, it is difficult to execute uh, these search warrants. Rather, they have remained suspended the investigations also could not be completed. And uh, uh, we are aware about that 167 provision that the person has to be necessarily released after a certain period. So those things are there. And uh, uh, a large number of uh, under trial prisoners have been released on account of COVID. And we do not know to what extent they would ultimately cooperate with the disposal of the cases. The pendency would certainly mount up but it is for the judiciary to take care of all this and uh, ensure that uh, uh, the issues are addressed as and when it, come, it comes before them. It will certainly depend upon the uh, wisdom of the judge, how he tackles these situations. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Chaudhary. There's one question, Justice Mishra, from, uh, we talked about it a bit, uh, but the question is, Bella, Bala Jyoti, Jyoti is asking, what steps are proposed as we speak to improve e-courts infrastructure in district courts to improve virtual uh, hearing mode and to improve and update technology? Because as, and I think one of the things that many are asking is also connected to the fact that the COVID-19 crisis is going to continue for a little longer than all of us thought. And so the paralysis 
or the potential paralysis of justice delivery system at the lower courts can cause significant impact in the entire justice delivery mechanism. So there's a sense of urgency in responding to the crisis at the lower courts. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, in fact, uh, I would start by taking up the case uh, from the High Court itself. See, the e-courts came into existence uh, certain years uh, ago in our court. And uh, Honorable the Chief, Chief Justice, the then Chief Justice, who's now heading the committee before the Supreme Court, his lordship took a lot of interest and uh, we went in for massive digitization and creation of infrastructure for creation of e-courts. We also launched certain, uh, certain jurisdictions were specifically assigned to e-courts in our court. But I would uh, admit and I would uh, I mean, just share the uh, actual uh, situation. The lawyers, the, number, the filing in those jurisdictions remained uh, limited and the bar also had not taken it up that well and adopted to the, uh, the technological growth in that sense of the term. It is only when the COVID crisis has come into existence that we suddenly find that now the lawyers, otherwise there was a lot of resistance uh, from the bar to accept uh, and to the virtual uh, mode and the filing of e-petitions. That was, it was, uh, it was not definitely not a very happy scenario. But things are now, it's, it's uh, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. The situation has come and people do realize that in case if they have to become, if they have to remain relevant, they have to adopt to the technology. Thank you very much. Yeah. There is a lot of there is a lot of emphasis now, and and the at the court level, the matters are being taken up. The e committee here, and every day the honourable chief justice and our e committee uh, in charge, uh, they are taking steps. They are taking stock of what is happening in districts. But uh, an honest assessment would be that uh, whatever has happened, it's the 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 infrastructure is there. It is being used also. But the potential to fully exploit is still very large and we do need to upgrade to a great extent. The exercise is on, we are in the process of updating ourselves and still be not just the infrastructure, also people's mentality. And because as of now, the people understand court means the actual courts. The concept that somebody would be sitting in at his home and would be the lawyers arguing and the judges deciding that this would be court is something which not only the lawyers have to go used to, but ultimately, as Honorable Chief Justice said, ultimately the common man, he has to accept. So all this is something and the COVID problem has come, hardly three months have gone. So it will take some more time before things really settle. But the system is responding more most effectively to upgrade itself and to see that the system is put in place because the rule of law will have to be implemented, will have to be protected, we have to remain relevant and we have to do, we have, in fact, the, this problem has now become virtually a human rights issue and therefore the courts have to rise. So there is absolutely no alternative. Thank you very much, Justice Mishra, for that comprehensive response. Justice Sudaris, there's one question from Prem Rajkumari and her question is specifically to you. What is your opinion on pre-litigation, mediation, and arbitration, should mediation without the order of the court be opened up during this unprecedented situation in order to give an opportunity to parties to resolve the disputes amicably? If this is a matter that you may be adjudicating, I, I will let you not to answer the question. No, 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 absolutely not. No, no, absolutely not. No, pre-litigation is something we can welcome. Now, uh, if you see arbitration as such, there are a lot of positives and there are some difficulties also. Yes. And especially a, a, a scenario like what we are having now. Now, uh, yes, you, you already, uh, many of the chief justices have dealt with the COVID Act of, uh, the, of the UK and then Singapore Act. If you see the, uh, the Singapore, uh, Singapore Act, it also presupposes this. It says that in so far as Section 9 applications, which we are facing with now, are concerned, is an automatic uh, suspension. If if a party an applicant wants to move the court and, and seek an, an, an urgent interim order, suppose like, like, like freezing the account or uh, not against the invocation of uh, bank, seeking invocation of bank guarantee, now a mere notice would be sufficient. So in, in a situation like this, 
it is always to be better to go for a negotiation a conciliation prior prior to the arbitration even if, even under our arbitration center rules also in chennai we have we have framed as uh, rules accordingly to go for this obviously now if you see arbitration now it has become a very costly affair though we are trying to 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 make it workable in a better way but then again another another uh, round of litigation will start so therefore this is something we need to encourage and what happens during this present pandemic situation somebody has also asked a question what if somebody the force major also somebody was saying about it we can very well uh, uh, go, go for uh, pre mediation especially keeping in mind of section 56 of the contract act where uh, where you know it, it is impossible to to perform the, the, uh, the contract frustration of contract would, would also would come so these are the factors it's better to negotiate and, and solve it so i think i think it's, it's a good idea now though though we uh, we, we we developed Uh, arbitration as a, as a, as a, as a as a good alternative uh, to, to the civil suit as a, as a rhetorical measure it has got its own its own uh, problems and difficulties so it's it's not sort of bad idea that today a litigant also knows the difficulties in in, in enlarging the continuous litigation therefore we need to encourage this thank you very much thank you very much mr sundaresh we have of course uh, left over 100 questions unanswered but i can't help it Uh, but we'll have one last question from my side to all of you. Uh, that is for those students of law who are watching this program. What would you like to tell them as they experience the uncertainty of this global pandemic, along with their studies in law schools? Those who are graduating this year, many of them are concerned about their careers. How do you think this pandemic that potentially can impact their careers in law and justice? And what could be your uh, piece of advice? as they look at their own future justice karol has already impacted their life it has brought a lot of uncertainty in their careers i'll tell you children be patient spend this time and spend the time which you get not only during this time but uh, while you are studying in uh, identifying as to what is the purpose you have speaking for myself i would want you to be judges i would want you to join this profession you are welcome to join any one of us as interns and understand how a judge works we are in a noble profession we are in a service oriented as a human being we have been born to serve so you must identify the purpose in life one in one advice which i want to give to all of you which i gave to my children who are also at one point of time pursuing law travel as much as you can and uh, in fact i told my children to travel right from the ganges up to uh, havra because there when you travel you educate yourself you read you write you understand various civilizations various cultures various courts which you will see you will understand what is ecology you will understand what what is economy you would understand what heritage is law is not only reading the book and uh, and and making submissions in court you have a life a time to do that you must identify a purpose you must analyze what life is that is all the best thank you very much justice karol justice chaudhary please my view is that it's time for them to take off it's time for them to rise it's an opportunity for them to rise and one thing i want to share with them which happened in my life that is uh, i was basically a, a tax practitioner indirect taxes so when in the year 2005 when uh, bihar finance act was to be uh, repealed and jharkhand vat act was to come up i felt that everybody howsoever senior the person was we were on the same platform 
So was the situation when there was a shift from VAT to GST. So this technology shift will bring great opportunities, has brought great opportunities for them. And I must share one thing, that those people, those children who have taken jurisprudence as a subject seriously, will certainly have an added advantage because we are going to have jurisprudential changes in our thought process, and that will have a long term. Thank you very much, Justice Chaudhary. Um, Justice Ashwini Kumar. Uh, this is a question which I would love to answer. Uh, the youngsters uh, to whom I am getting a chance to address generally are very comfortable with technology. They are also, like your university, it's a research oriented university. The problem which we are presenting crisis because of the pandemic. The governments are coming forward with policies as because it is happening so fast that to conceive of all situations which would arise and to plan it accordingly is not happening. And therefore the individuals, despite best attempts by the governments and the courts, are still there are instances where people are not uh, uh, being given a fair treatment as they deserve. So the first uh, suggestion would be that like, a petition is to be filed. There are detailed procedures. Now, because of the COVID, the courts are entertaining e petitions. My first uh, suggestion to them would be to remain alive to what is happening in their neighborhood, in the districts, or the places where they're living where they find that there are specific instances where people are being denied rights. Please take up their causes. Please take up their causes. Send petitions, even if it is not manually possible, send it by mail. Do research. Don't file just petitions or public interest petitions as uh, many of them are for publicity. But please understand that this is a godsend opportunity to you to come to the rescue of such downtrodden persons. Please collect information about such persons, the difficulties that they are facing, what are the shortcomings which the policies have, and then bring it to the notice of the court because the courts also, many a times we are conscious of what is happening, but in the absence of necessary research and somebody bringing the matter before the court, there are suomoto petitions, but then all kind of exigencies cannot be done. So first thing that I would, and I, I would give one illustration. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the state government had come out with certain directions in the state of Uttar Pradesh to ensure that medical access is provided. When the spurt took place in the COVID-19 patients, certain officers at their level passed certain orders which restricted the access to medical health in, health in the form of denial of OPDs. Now, certain persons and certain law students brought the matter to the notice of the court. This court took cognizance of it and called upon the state government, what are you have doing because denial of OPD facility is uh, extremely detrimental to their interests. Today in the newspaper, I found the very next day, the state government corrected its stand and came out with a remedial course. So it's not exactly, many a times what is happening is that the facts are not being brought to the notice of the concerned authority. So the, 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 the litigation, it's not in, uh, in exactly adversarial uh, in nature at this point of time. The concerns have to be addressed. It has to be highlighted to the proper authorities. So the moment if such causes are brought by these students, they are good at uh, technology, they can do the research. Please do the service to the humankind and the mankind and bring these matters. And secondly, utilize this time, read the autobiographies, read the good books and, and, and so that uh, as my Lord the Chief Justice said, it's a service oriented profession so that you are really equipped to take up the cause of such persons. Thank you very much, Justice Mishra. Justice Sundaresh. Yes. Be the change that you want to be. Use the technology. Laws are going to change. You will be in a better position than your senior. You will be getting a lot of new cases in new fields. 
like cyber law crime on the criminal side and then competition act on the other civil litigation be flexible learn the new enactments update yourself follow the ethics of the profession you will certainly succeed as future belongs to you thank you very much thank you very much justice sundresh uh, let me first of all take the opportunity to thank our most distinguished judges and including the chief justice uh, for sparing this valuable time we've already gone past 20 minutes beyond our scheduled uh, time to end i deeply appreciate the time that you've taken and indeed your candid remarks and also inspiring set of reflections on a range of issues that are that is confronting the rule of law and access to justice this high court judges colloquium that we uh, we had today would have given immense opportunities for people to think and reflect about the extraordinary work that you're doing i also want to make special mention that each one of you and this is for all the audience these judges whom we heard today are out, were outstanding lawyers they decided to be part of the judiciary because they believed in the cause of justice they believed in the cause of public service and i hope some of you uh, chose to embark on those careers as well i want to take this opportunity to thank our distinguished audience as well i regret the fact that i couldn't answer get over to 100 plus questions which remain unanswered but i appreciate that you joined us in this i also want to thank live law for being part of this public interest initiative that op jindal global university at jindal global law school has promoted through these colloquiums as we end this i want to once again thank everybody who has been part of we will meet again on saturday this saturday 20th for another uh, very distinguished colloquium called the law justice and judges colloquium on the theme supreme but not infallible reflections on the future of the supreme court of india and we have with us five distinguished former judges of the supreme court of india honorable mr justice swatantra kumar former judge supreme court of india honorable mr justice gyan sudha mishra former judge supreme court of india honorable mr justice uh, s s nijer former judge supreme court of india honorable justice arjun k sikri former judge supreme court of india and honorable mr justice ak patnaik former judge supreme court of india all of them will be joined uh, and joining me at 6:30 pm and i look forward to seeing all of you Thank you very much, uh, Justice Karol, Justice Sundaresh, Justice uh, Chaudhary, and Justice Ashwini Kumar for your time and your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.